Welcome everybody to the Krista and Dana Reeve Foundation's Live Better series. I'm Rob Gerth. I'm the Director of Digital Media here at the Foundation. And today we're talking about wheelchair basketball. And we're lucky enough to have three, almost a whole team, three experts uh, today to talk to us about that. And we'll meet those guys in just a minute. Uh, but first a little bit of housekeeping. You see there's a poll up on the screen right now. Uh, we just want to get an idea of who's watching and what kind of uh, experience or, or no experience that you've had. So take a minute just to click on the poll if you don't mind. And uh, we're also going to have a question and answer at the end. And there's two ways you can do that. One is you can use the chat feature and you can just enter your question. And, and as you think of them, you can enter a question in. Uh, and the other thing you can do, which is pretty unique I think, is that you can call in and actually talk to our guests over the phone. So don't be afraid to do that. And we're going to uh, introduce you uh, to Lena, who is our operator for today. And she's going to give you the details on that. Lena? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a live question on today's call, you may do so by dialing in at 1-800-931-1309. And to unmute your line, you just press 66 on your telephone keypad. To remute your line once your question has been answered, you may press 63. As Rob has mentioned, you may also register your question via the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. And if at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, you may press the star zero. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded Wednesday, February 20th, 2013. And I would now like to turn the call back over to Rob. Please go ahead. And so don't forget, with great power, thank you, Lena, by the way, with great power comes great responsibility. So when we get to the question and answer spot and you do unmute by hitting 66, um, make sure you mute again by hitting 63. Otherwise, your dog will be barking in the background. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, Today our host is Dan Humphreys, and Dan is the president of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. So go ahead, take it away, Dan. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Rob. Uh, very happy to be here with the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation um, uh, presenting some information on wheelchair basketball. Uh, as Rob said, I am the president of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. I'm also the director of training, education, and certification for Blaze Sports America, which is the legacy organization from the 1996 Paralympic Games. Um, as you can see on my slide there, I've got about 15 years of experience in wheelchair basketball. I've coached uh, youth, I've coached adults, I've coached women. I've coached uh, U20 teams internationally. Um, I have experience as a classifier, so I've, I've worn a lot of hats within wheelchair basketball and uh, looking forward to bringing some uh, more information to you today and hopefully introduce you to a sport that, that I love. But uh, more importantly, we have a couple other guests with us today. Um, our, uh, one of our presenters will be Paul Schulte, and uh, Paul is with us, and he's going to tell you a lot about his life, so I won't spend too much time on a slide uh, because I can't do nearly enough justice uh, for him. But what I would like to say is I've known Paul for a long time, and uh, there, there aren't many better people in the world, uh, let alone wheelchair basketball players. I've had the opportunity to coach Paul. I've also had more opportunities to coach against Paul, and coaching him is infinitely more fun than coaching against him, I will tell you that. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think you're really going to enjoy his story and uh, how wheelchair basketball has had an impact on, on so many different facets of his life, and we'll be getting to him in just a minute here. Our other presenter is uh, the Executive Director of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association, Randy Schubert. Uh, Randy has been with the NWBA for a little over a year now. He's done an excellent job. And uh, one of his uh, goals in the coming years is to not only increase the number of people participating in uh, wheelchair basketball through the National Wheelchair Basketball Association, but to also grow the number of teams. So he's going to give you some information near the end of the presentation about how you can link up with uh, local teams in your area and get connected and uh, take advantage of all the great things that uh, wheelchair basketball and the National Wheelchair Basketball Association has to offer. So today well, we want to accomplish a, a few things, and uh, as you can see the object objectives up there, as I said, Paul is going to tell you a lot about how he got introduced to wheelchair basketball and the difference that made in his life, and hopefully some of uh, the stories he has will resonate with some of you that are, are, are listening. We want to make sure you understand uh, who is eligible to play wheelchair basketball um, at a competitive and Paralympic level, and you might be surprised that uh, um, you don't have to use a wheelchair every day to be able to play wheelchair 
military basketball, and we'll get into that. Also want to be able to explain to you uh, the classification system that's used in wheelchair basketball that ensures uh, equitable and fair play and that uh, skill and talent, not the presence or lack of disability, uh, affects the outcome of a competition. Uh, give you a brief rundown of the rules in wheelchair basketball. Most of them are the exact same rules as stand-up basketball, but there are a few minor changes that we want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, we also want to discuss uh, all the benefits that you can get from playing wheelchair basketball, and they're not all physical benefits. There's uh, social and mental, psychological benefits as well, and we want to touch on those, and I'm sure you get a lot of that during uh, Paul's presentation as well. And then again, finally, we just want to make sure that you know how you can get connected with your closest uh, wheelchair basketball program so that if you're inspired by what you hear today and it interests you, you can take that to the next step and actually get, uh, get uh, participating in a local Local program. So with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to Paul Schulte, a current uh, U.S. national team member, bronze medalist from London, and uh, let Paul uh, tell you his story. Paul? Thanks, Dan. Um, that's uh, that was a pretty awesome intro. Appreciate that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here today to be asked by uh, the NWBA and to be a guest of the Christa Reeves Foundation. Um, I'd kind of like to start by saying how much I appreciate um, the Christa and Dana Reeves Foundation and for them putting on these types of programs for people. Um, really do change lives, and so it's an honor to be a guest and to participate. And I, you know, my primary purpose in uh, in being involved in this is is really to is is really as Dan said to to share my story. And I hope that uh, some aspect of my story uh, resonates uh, with individuals, um, whether they're planning to, uh, whether they'd like to participate in uh, sports for uh, sports for persons with disabilities, or, uh, or or even if there's another aspect of their life uh, that part of my story can help out with. That's that's really why I'm on today. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity, and I'd like to say that in general, um, as a general statement, as I begin, wheelchair basketball has been an incredible vehicle in my life. Um, by vehicle, I mean that uh, it's it's helped me make it to opportunities. It's helped me helped introduce me to role models and set some life goals that I really can't say uh, that I would have uh, encountered or been uh, introduced to otherwise. Um, I grew up in a pretty darn small town in uh, Michigan. The place was named Manchester, Michigan, and it was near Ann Arbor. For anybody that knows. Uh, knows Michigan pretty well. So yes, grew up a Wolverine fan. And, uh, and some of the pictures you see there are, uh, are of myself growing up. Uh, the leftmost picture, you don't see any concrete in that picture. And that's because I grew, out in the, grew up out in the country. And probably about the closest sidewalk was, uh, oh, five, ten miles away. Um, it was a great place to grow up. And I was, if I could describe myself, uh, I would say that I was a sports fanatic. Um, probably even too much. Um, you see kind of the baseball picture there. I was the only kid I knew, that was the only eight-year-old I knew that uh, set his own practice regimen and practiced in the backyard two hours a day. Um, I, I've, I've met a number of kids that are, that are uh, really, really focused on sports in their lives, but man, I don't know if I've found one that was as focused as I was. It was everything to me, and as I mentioned, it was probably just a little bit too much. Um, I was in the middle of five kids, and uh, of all the kids, I was the most sports inclined. So uh, uh, the reason I say it's probably a little bit too much is that uh, I, even, as a, uh, even as an 8, 9, 10-year-old, I was having a hard time focusing at school. And I really wasn't uh, focusing much on my family either. And that may sound like high expectations for a kid of that age, but, but I, know, I, I know myself at that age. And so um, I take kind of a unique perspective of, uh, of what happened to me when I was 10 years old. When I was 10 years old, the day after my birthday in 1989, I was involved in a head-on collision car accident in which I fractured my L2 vertebrae and kind of lived the story that, uh, that some people on this call may know very dearly, uh, very closely, um, and, and the story that others may have only heard of where you wake up in the hospital bed and you can't move your legs. And um, any time that somebody undergoes some, some really difficult adversity in their life, some true adversity, um, it, it, it affects the way that you define yourself. Um, and that's what was so hard for me. Even as a 10-year-old, I was thinking to myself, well, if I can't play sports, hold on a second. I mean, I, I was really planning the rest of my life around playing sports. And if I can't run and I can't play sports, then in a sense, I was really kind of struggling with, struggling with well, well, who am I if I can't do those things? Um, fortunate, 
fortunate for me, for sure. I had a, I had a loving family that was right around me that helped me, helped me realize uh, very quickly that I was the same person after the accident as I was before. Um, and that, that helped me a great deal, but, um, but also I was, I was heartbroken that I wasn't going to be able to participate in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the activities that I had come to know and love as sports. Um, it wasn't very long after, uh, after I got injured that, that a therapist of mine said, hey, you should really, you know, you were into sports so much before, Paul, and, and you're making good progress. It won't be long before you're back at your school and back in your, uh, your regular life. And uh, she said, you should really try wheelchair sports. And I said, no thanks. And I didn't even hesitate. I said, not even interested, even a little bit. And she said, well, why not? And, and, and I had a hard time voicing it to her then, but I can tell you now that I had a negative stereotype of disabled sports. Um, I felt that it probably wasn't going to be very, this was, this was a wrong impression, but my impression was that it, that it probably wasn't going to be very competitive, uh, and it also wasn't going to be very athletic. And um, in, in short, it was going to be different than what I had known before. And I was not ready um, at that age. And it actually took a couple of years for me to be in a position where I was ready to receive an invitation to play wheelchair basketball. Um, so timing would prove to be very important. Well, I got back home, and I got back uh, with a number of my friends, and they helped modify playground rules for me so that I could, uh, so I could still participate with them uh, in the sports that I loved. But it did, uh, there came a point about four years after my accident when I was 14 years old and I had gotten out with, uh, with my friends on the playground and um, it was just becoming more and more evident that I was only going to be able to, uh, <laughs> quote unquote, hang with them uh, so much longer. You know, my friends were, were starting to get to the age where they could jump up and they could grab the hoop. Um, they were in seventh grade was a, in our little town. Seventh grade is when um, they were body sports. You could start to play for the school team. And it was just apparent to me that, that sooner or later something would have to change. Well, around that same time, around that same time, I had an invitation to go take a one-time visit to, a, uh, to an adult wheelchair basketball practice. And at that time, as I said, it was, it was the right timing for me that now I was kind of receptive uh, to the idea of, 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 of trying something along a little bit different path than I had been doing. And um, what also appealed to me is that they said, this is going to be an adult wheelchair basketball practice. And I thought to myself, well, hold on a second. Uh, a, bunch, a bunch of adult men aren't going to show up to wheelchair basketball practice unless it's without being fairly competitive, right? And, and that kind of appealed to me because I definitely wanted the, uh, a high level of sports. You know, my dream was to either play professional sports or to play in the Olympics. And so I wanted, uh, I wanted that competition. And so I thought, all right, well, um, if I show up to this wheelchair basketball practice with a bunch of adults, I'm, I probably also don't have a chance to hang. Uh, and that kind of appealed to me um, because I didn't want to be—I didn't want to be handed anything. I wanted to—I wanted a challenge. So I went to that wheelchair basketball practice, still with a number of negative stereotypes in my in my mind. And I remember getting out of the car that night and going into the gym and saying to my dad, "Well, you know what? If it doesn't work out, then at least it was just one night." And it turned out to be a lot more than just one night. When I came in the gym, the first wheelchair basketball player I ever met. Uh, I would I would say that he that that, that someone of his caliber uh, his of his caliber excuse me is more uncommon rather than common. Um, he was a double amputee whose arms were larger than my head. He strapped into his basketball wheelchair, which I immediately noticed that his basketball wheelchair was much different than my everyday wheelchair. Uh, he could do he could hit three pointers. He could do a handstand with his chair strapped to him. Uh, he could get up. He could get down on the floor and get back up off the floor in the same way that an able body might uh, fall down and get back up. Uh, he could get down and get back up just as fast as any able body could. And immediately, immediately upon watching him just push up and down the floor and start getting ready for practice, a few of my stereotypes were completely shattered, and I knew that this was going to be a, a neat experience. Well, I fell in love with it. One of the things that they did the first night is they put me in a basketball wheelchair. And that was a special experience for me because um, basketball wheelchairs are quite different than the wheelchairs that we use every day. And when I was uh, pushing up and down the court, the way that I describe it to people now um, is that I felt like, in a sense, that somebody had handed me my legs back. I felt like I was running again. I could feel the wind on my face and, uh, and on my hair. Of course, I shaved my head now, so I, I really did have hair back then. But, uh, but I, I remember that vividly. 
And I remember going up to my dad and saying, Dad, this is amazing. Why can't I take a chair like this to school? That's how good my basketball chair felt. And, uh, and Dad said, well, you know, son, because of the wheels being slanted out, you're probably not going to fit in the bathroom too well. And, uh, and, it, and it came to be over time that, I, that I've, uh, in, my, in my profession and in my experience in the sport, I've come to understand what makes a basketball wheelchair so much different and, and why it's so cool. But let's just say, in a nutshell, that I was hooked from my experience that night at the gym. And I actually ended up getting a lot more than I had bargained for. My involvement in wheelchair basketball, I, I said that it's been a vehicle. And I wouldn't say that, uh, that wheelchair sports and wheelchair basketball has been a stepping stone in for me in my life. I would say that, uh, in my experience, it's been a springboard. Um, things that I've taken away that I never really bargained for. I mean, when I was 14 years old, I showed up because uh, basketball was the candy. I mean, I just wanted to play a sport. But uh, looking back now, I'm 34 years old, so I've been playing 20 years. And the things that I've uh, benefited that I never really uh, that I never really bargained for in the first place was was an increase of confidence. You see a picture of uh, of me there with uh, with my wife Megan. Uh, Megan grew up in the same small town as I did in Michigan, and we dated in high school, so we were uh, high school sweethearts, you could say. Um, uh, so you know my my initial outlook on life and my confidence level um, shot up quickly. Um, because no longer was I, you know, a single kid in my high school that was in a wheelchair. Now I was amongst peers and amongst athletes. And um, as, I, as I built confidence there, it overflowed into other areas of my life. Um, I had to go very quick, but I wanted to play for a. I heard of university teams, college teams that have wheelchair basketballs, uh, colleges that have wheelchair basketball teams, and immediately that became my goal. The concept of uh, playing at a university was was something that. Uh, I remember as a 10-year-old, I thought it would forever be uh, out of my reach. And, uh, and so I can tell you that my interest, in, uh, my interest in school and having good grades shot up increasingly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, would say that, I would say that to that point in my life, when I, uh, when I found wheelchair basketball, I had been given lots of advice on how to deal with life with a spinal cord injury. And lots of that advice came from my parents and from my therapists and from loved ones and, and people that cared very deeply about me. And all that advice was really good advice. All that, that advice, I could nod my head and I kind of had a black and white understanding that yes, everything you're telling me is good, that it's important to be independent, that I can still do anything I want to do. But until I really found wheelchair basketball, uh, I couldn't see the path directly in front of me. I had a lot of hope that my life could still be the way I wanted it to be, but I couldn't see the path to where I wanted to go. And that's what wheelchair basketball provided for me and the experiences that I had in it. Was it went from kind of a black and white cognitive understanding to a full color vision of what was possible. And so, uh, so my grades shot up because that full color vision included uh, playing for a college wheelchair basketball team uh, and maybe even someday competing for the, for the national team for the, uh, for the United States of America. And, uh, and so the impact on my life, I guess I can't really, I can't really understate it. Um, uh, the, the role models is an important one that I want to touch on very briefly uh, as far as the impact on my life. One of the first guys that I met was, uh, was the gentleman that I described. It was a double amputee and was just this amazing physical specimen. But there was another guy that I met that night. Um, the first guy's name was Chris. The second guy that I met uh, was Kevin. Kevin was a pretty high-level spinal cord injury, meaning that he really had no control of his abs or of, uh, of his laterals, of his low back. Um, and, and Kevin, uh, the reason I, I took very keen uh, awareness of Kevin is that Kevin was the first person in a wheelchair that I met that had a career, drove a Corvette, and had a girlfriend. And when I saw that, when I met Kevin, I mean, Chris was, uh, Chris was an amazing physical athlete, but when I met Kevin, I was like, well, wait a second. I was kind of resigned to the fact that I'd only ever be able to drive a minivan. And so as far as the impact on my life, when I spoke with Kevin and got to know him, I thought, well, hold on a second. Here's that full-color vision of what I want in the future. I would like a, I would like a cool car of my own selection, and I would like to I, – I, I, I had hopes and dreams of, of being married and having kids, and, uh, and I wanted a career as well. And so, uh, and so meeting, that, meeting those important role models, you can't really understate um, the impact of those. And, and from a basketball perspective, you better believe that the first time that, uh, that, that Kevin took the ball from me and, and hit an 18-foot jump shot, 
uh, I was my my whole world changed. Uh, there was somebody right in front of me that I perceived to have less overall ability than me, but that was doing more with it. And that's one of the beauties of uh, wheelchair basketball and the Paralympic movement in general is that it's it's about people that have that have plenty of reasons to um, to step back from their dreams and from their goals, but they uh, but they do it anyway, and that's that's universally compelling. Well, um, I, I did get. I was, I was very fortunate to, to be around that, that group of individuals that took me underneath their wing and, and, and taught me the sport of wheelchair basketball. And when I was 18 years old, um, I was given an invitation to try out uh, for the U.S. national team, the men's team. And, um, and we can talk more about the, the men's team here in a little bit and as far as what, uh, what, where the men's team competes at. Um, but I thought, man, I don't even have a chance to compete on this team. And uh, and before that appealed to me, but now it was uh, I was I had I had more ego on the line, and I was uh, I was worried about getting shown up and maybe a number of other things. But I really felt like I didn't have a chance to make the USA team. Uh, but I was convinced by a few friends that that if I that if I stuck my neck out there and I really gave it a try, that I could only really benefit from uh, from pushing myself beyond uh, what I felt I could do. And um, at 18 years old, I was I was picked last on the team to my shock. Uh, they actually uh, Dan Burns was the name of the coach at that time, and he picked me 12th to the team, and took me in 1998 to the World Championships um, in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I was I was fully um, fully content with being uh, being the water boy on that team if I needed to be. Uh, but Dan had other plans for me, and I, uh, I really, I really put my everything into becoming as good as I could be, and uh, and I played significant minutes in uh, the 1998 team, and we won a world championship, um, and so it was a, it was an amazing first go around with the USA team, and I think that that, that helped contribute to uh, to to my chances of making another team and another team, and so I have been in, I have been involved with the U.S. national team. Uh, since 1998, I've played in um, I've played in a number of different countries. I've played in um, France, Germany, all over South America, Japan, Australia a few times. Um, just amazing, amazing experiences, and um, some of our achievements were were a few world championship uh, gold medals, and then I've won uh, I've two I've won two bronze medals in the Paralympics. So representing the USA has been an amazing experience for me. I've gone from being kind of the baby of the team that, that was happy to just hand out water if he had the opportunity uh, to being one of the veterans, and I was one of the co-captains of the team that competed this past year in London, England. Today, um, today if I could tell you briefly about my, my family, my career, and beyond, I guess this would be the results of that impact that I spoke of earlier. I live in Bradenton, Florida. I'm 34 years old. Uh, my wife Megan and I have been married this year. It will be 13 years. Uh, we have a son, Brady, who, is, uh, who turns three uh, next month. Uh, I graduated from the University of Texas at Arlington with a degree in mechanical engineering. So it's kind of funny that a, an initial fear and struggle with math actually turned into a career for me. Um, I work for Invicare Top End, and I assist, and uh, I'm on the design team here. And we actually get to design the products uh, that people use in a variety of disabled sports. Um, uh, my favorite of which is wheelchair basketball. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a. I feel I feel very fortunate and very blessed to have had the opportunities I have in my life, um, the role models and the uh, and the circumstances that wheelchair basketball has presented me with, and I feel like uh, sure there's a lot of hard work involved too, um, but that I really uh, I really see an incredible benefit that takes place in the lives of people with um, physical disabilities when they're able to tap into uh, tap into a sport like wheelchair basketball. So with that. Uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to hand it off uh, so that uh, my co-presenter can talk a little bit about uh, wheelchair basketball and uh, and how exactly who can play and who can be involved. Thanks, Paul, and uh, great job. It's always great hearing uh, uh, you know hearing your story and uh, hearing the stories of a lot of people that have been impacted by wheelchair basketball. Obviously. 
Paul's got a great story. He's very successful. But, uh, you know, if, if we had four hours, we could have just lined people up with the similar stories about how wheelchair basketball and, and many other sports as well have affected their lives. But now we want to get into uh, specifically wheelchair basketball and uh, let you know who can play because it, a lot of times there's some misunderstanding about who is eligible and who isn't eligible. And uh, there's some information up there on the slide for you, but it, it's really fairly simple. If you have a permanent uh, disability of the lower extremities that prohibits you from playing stand-up wheelchair basketball competitively, you can play wheelchair basketball uh, with the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. Um, uh, you can see different types of disabilities that are listed there, spinal cord injury, amputation, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, people who are, who are post-polio survivors. Um, also, uh, we, we've got something uh, that we'll talk about in just a minute called minimum disability and when we get into classification. But that picture that I put up there, um, uh, that's a picture of James Adams. He, uh, uh, he plays with the Shepherd Steelers. Uh, Paul got a chance to play with him for a year when I coached Paul uh, at the, with the Shepherd team. And James is very unique. He's a quadrilateral amputee. And uh, James uh, contracted uh, uh, meningitis when he was an infant and subsequently lost uh, portions of all four limbs. And uh, his sport of choice is wheelchair basketball. He could easily be a world-class uh, wheelchair rugby player, but uh, chooses wheelchair basketball. And, uh, and uh, Paul can verify this, plays it at a fairly high level. Um, can shoot three-pointers, can ball handle, uh, can push his chair faster than I can even push a chair. Uh, so uh, when we talk about who can play wheelchair basketball, you don't have to use a wheelchair every day. Uh, you don't even have to have hands to play wheelchair basketball. You just have to have a love for the sport, a desire to learn, and uh, an opportunity uh, to get a ball and a hoop and uh, some people around you that will help you learn how to, uh, how to play the game. Talk about classification, and this is one of the things that's uh, uh, really misunderstood, I think, by people who are outside of uh, adapted sport, disability sport, and Paralympic sport. Um, classification uh, was created in order to make sure that there's a fair playing field among participants. Uh, when you look at individual sports like uh, wheelchair tennis or track and field, it makes sure that people are competing one-on-one uh, -on, -one on a fair, on a fair uh, system. When you get into team sports, it gets a little bit more complicated, and we still utilize a classification system, and we're, the NWBA is transitioning to the same classification system that's used by the International Wheelchair Basketball Federation. Uh, it's based on a, a scale of where players are assigned a point value from one point to four and a half points in half point increments. And of the five players on the floor, the total number of points assigned to those players cannot exceed 14 points. Uh, so earlier Paul talked about one of the first people he met, Kevin, who had a higher level spinal cord injury. Within this point classification system, he would most likely be either somewhere between a one or a two, a one, one and a half, a 2.0, a lower classification. That means that his functional ability, the amount of muscle control he has, is less than someone that would be a two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half. But as Paul noted in his story, that doesn't mean his skill level is potentially less than someone who is a higher level classification. As Paul noted, Kevin took the ball away from him and hit an 18 pointer. So the functional classification system isn't about how well you develop your skill, it's about what you have available to develop. So a person can uh, can have a lower uh, classification, can be a, a 1.5, a 2.0, but their skill level can actually exceed that of a person with a higher classification because they've developed their fun they've developed their skill through their functional ability more than someone with a higher classification has. So uh, when you get right down to it, it's a system that simply makes sure that we're putting people out there that have a fair chance to compete equitably against each other. I'm sure we'll have some more questions on that when we get to the Q&A. The next thing we want to talk about is the rules. As I said at the beginning, the majority of the rules are the exact same as they are for the stand-up game. The NWBA utilizes as a base the NCAA Division I men's rules. So we play five on five. We play on a full, full court. The basket's the same. The free throw line's the same. Play with the same, same ball. We utilize their shot clock, 35 seconds, and a 
10 second backcourt violation. And that's the, the basis from where we start and we do make some modifications from there. A couple of the variations within the rules. There is no double dribble within wheelchair basketball. So you can dribble the ball, pick it up, put it in your lap, dribble it again. Uh, as such, you can also take a shot, airball it, and catch it yourself, um, which hopefully doesn't happen too often. Uh, but uh, that is legal as there is no, no double dribble violation rule in wheelchair basketball. We do have traveling. Uh, the traveling rule, as you can see, for every, time, every two pushes, you have to dribble once. So you could have the ball in your lap, push your chair two times, and then you need to dribble it. Then you can put it back in your lap, push the, your chair two more times, and then dribble it. As you develop your skill, obviously, you're keeping that dribble going more and more, not picking it up, because as, as you're picking it up, uh, you're slowing yourself down a little bit. Um, just as in stand-up basketball, we have a three-second violation in the lane. The variation for wheelchair basketball from stand-up basketball is rather than just three seconds, if you're in there, the whistle blows, it's a turnover. Because of the nature of wheelchair basketball where you just don't have lateral or vertical movement and with the size of the chairs you can't just slip through little creases like you would in stand-up basketball, if you're in the lane and you get trapped in the lane and you continually make an attempt to exit the lane, then the three-second call will stop. Now, if you're in the lane attempting to exit and all of a sudden uh, you stop and try to get a pass, now you're going to get dinged for a three-second call. And the other thing, and this is one of the questions that always comes up with uh, new players and especially uh, officials who are trying to get into the game and, and officiate wheelchair basketball, you know, how, you know, how do you, how, what's the chair? I mean, is that part of the body? Is it something else? Well, the chair is considered part of the body. So uh, if you had contact chair to chair um, that, uh, that uh, would, be, would be a foul if it was body to body, that's essentially the rule of thumb. But it does take some getting used to. And uh, depending on who you talk to, you talk to coaches, they think it should be called one way. You talk to officials, it gets called another way. Um, and as we know, no official ever made a right call ever. So <laughs> it's something, you, uh, something that you just kind of need to learn by experience uh, and adapt to as you go along. Some of the other variations we have we, within wheelchair basketball, we have a women's division, uh, and Randy will talk about the different divisions in a few minutes here. But uh, the one rule variation that the women have is they play with the women's ball, the same uh, women's ball that uh, collegiate women and uh, women in the um, WNBA play with, the same size ball. Other than that, they play with all the same rules as everyone else does uh, within the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. Now, our, our youngest division is uh, in the junior division. It's the prep division, and that's for people who are 12 and under. And we have a few extra um, changes for them in order to make sure that uh, they can be successful at the game. Uh, they use an 8.5-foot basket rather than a 10-foot basket. And there's two ways to accomplish that. One, if you have a basket that just simply lowers, that's great. You can lower it down to 8.5 feet. Or they also make add-on baskets. And in that lower picture, you can see uh, that's a little add-on basket that just attaches to a 10-foot rim and brings the basket down to 8.5 feet uh, for the prep players. Rather than two 20-minute halves, they play four 8-minute quarters. Uh, the prep players also use the women's ball. Instead of a 15-foot line, they play with a 13-foot free throw line. And then because these are younger players just getting to learn the game, there is a no-pressing rule within that division of play uh, in the junior division. And uh, that essentially uh, wraps up the rules changes, and hopefully we'll have some uh, questions on that in the Q&A if I confused any of you. But uh, what I'd like to do now, since we do have a design engineer from one of the top uh, sport wheelchair manufacturers in the world uh, as one of our presenters, I'd like to turn it back over to Paul and let him talk to you a little bit about uh, the wheelchair ba the, the chair specifically designed for wheelchair basketball. Paul? Thanks, Dan. Well, um, so what you see on your screen is, a, is an example of a basketball wheelchair. And you might recall me saying earlier that the first time I sat in a sports wheelchair, I didn't, I didn't really want to get out of it. And I felt like uh, someone, had be, someone had handed me back the sensation of running again. Um, and I looked at my dad and said, well, why can't, I, why can't I take this one to school? This is so much fun. What's, what's different about a basketball wheelchair and, a, and, a, and an everyday wheelchair? And Dad pointed out that the rear wheels, or the largest wheels on the chair, are, are slanted outwards. And um, 
and he, and he pointed out that that probably wouldn't fit in the bathroom too good. And, and then he brought up the fact that, that it's got some real little wheels on the front and some really little wheels in the back, and that those those probably don't go too well on anything other than a basketball court. Uh, they are rollerblade wheels, and if you're trying to go through grass or even some uneven uh, some uneven sidewalk, uh, it's not the it's not the most comfortable thing you could use. And so when I talk about uh, sports equipment, I usually use the analogy of sports shoes. Um, uh, the, the the chair the wheelchair that I use for everyday purposes is a lot a lot more similar to a comfortable pair of shoes that I feel that I feel good in being all day long. Whereas my basketball chair is really like a high performance lightweight basketball shoe that uh, that is not necessarily intended uh, to be used all day long and and, 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 and probably probably wouldn't be <laughs> comfortable the entire day long. However, it feels fantastic on a basketball court and in basketball competition. Um, some of the uh, first questions that I receive uh, are certainly related to the camber. One of the other things I hear is uh, they, people say, well, w with basketball wheelchairs, uh, can you just make them as tall as you want? You know, can somebody be so tall as they could dunk the ball? And I said, no, no. You know, there is a there is a rule that uh, as far as the chain, as far as the chair itself, there's a maximum seat height associated with the chair, both internationally and uh, and and here in the United States, and that's to prevent players from uh, from just taking their chair up to. Um, uh, to an unfair height, and so um, in, in the United States here, traditionally it's been 21 inches is the tallest you can have the frame of your seat, um, and so that kind of levels the playing field a little bit. If you got a really long torso, that that, that uh, just makes you that much taller. Um, but there is a there is a restriction as far as that seat height goes. Um, when it comes to equipment. Typically, when you start out in a sport like wheelchair basketball, people say, "Well, how much does a chair like this cost?" And the answer is, it varies. There's a few different manufacturers um, th uh, throughout the United States and internationally. And on average, I would say that you could uh, that, uh, that you could pay uh, on the on the smaller side. Individuals might pay somewhere around fifteen hundred dollars, all the way up to. It's kind of like any other piece of sports equipment. You can pay as much as you want to pay. <laughs> you know, if you go looking for a very expensive tennis racket, you can go find a very expensive tennis racket. And so, the most expensive basketball chair I can think of would probably make it up in the range of about five thousand, six thousand um, dollars. But when you're going to start out, for a number of people, they go, "Whoa, that's a lot of money." Well, that's that's a, that's a pretty large barrier to to competing. And the reality is, is that you don't need $1,500 to get started in wheelchair basketball. My first chair uh, was a hand-me-down, and that's, that's the case with a lot of players. If you want to get involved with wheelchair basketball, the best thing you can do is find a local team, go out to a practice just like I did, and then talk with some of the players. Let them try. Uh, they'll let you try their chair. And, uh, and a number of programs will have a hand-me-down chair, a used chair that, uh, that you can start out in. And that's exactly what I started out in. Um, when users are relatively new, I'm going to talk about this slide now, so you'll see that it says adjustable. Um, because, uh, because the dimensions of a basketball chair can, uh, can make a dramatic difference uh, on how good someone feels in their chair and, how much, and, and consequently how much fun they're having in the sport, um, it, can be, uh, it can be really advantageous to begin with an adjustable chair. Um, a chair that allows you to change uh, the seat height, the backrest height. Um, you see on there that you have the freedom to change your uh, center of gravity. Well, what does that mean, Paul? Well, center of gravity, um, in the easiest way to describe it, it controls how fast your chair spins. So if you want your chair to spin really fast and effortlessly, um, then there's adjustment for that. Um, Let's see here. One chair can fit many different athletes in sports. Correct. So with that adjustability, you can have program chairs that can be that can be tweaked to an individual based on their needs. Um, it's important to point out that somebody, like the two individuals that I pointed out earlier, you know, Kevin, who had a higher level injury and didn't have much control of his core and his balance, is going to need something different in a wheelchair than Chris, who was a double amputee and and uh, and sat up really tall and. Um, had a lot of function, and so uh, that adjustability is particularly important for uh, for individuals with spinal cord injuries or, or spina bifida, or depending on their on their disability. Um, they're not infinitely adjustable. Um, they 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 are designed to cover a range that is most common um, for athletes uh, using using chairs in today's sport. So that's the adjustable chair. Um, there is also uh, the rigid chair, and so as as players experiment with uh, with their own chair and its adjustability, and they also talk with other um, athletes and, and try their chairs, they start to zero in on what works really well for them. 
Um, and it's, there's, there's a lot of common ground between a lot of athletes and what they like on their chairs. And, and once you start to zero in on what you really like, then there start to become other concerns. You start to say, well, how do I get this chair to be lighter? How can I make it, how can I make it as good as it can possibly be? And a number of times that has to do with decreasing the number of places that it bolts together. And so what you're looking at here is the, is the rigid custom fit. Um, these chairs are made specifically for the individual. They're tailored, they're tailored to you, just in the same way that a, that, a, that a really nice set of golf clubs is tailored right to the golfer. Um, and even in some cases, a really nice pair of shoes or a suit would be made just for that individual. And um, it's made according to the dimensions and, and specifications that either the athlete wants or, or being a design engineer and an athlete, a number of times I'm at a competition or I'm somewhere and someone says, hey, Paul, you got a lot of experience. Would you mind measuring me and giving your input on, on how you think I should sit and how I should set my chair up? Um, it is recommended that, uh, that, they, that, you, uh, that you start with an adjustable chair or hand-me-down chair, and then uh, a number of players eventually make it to the point where they want, uh, they want something low maintenance, they want something high performing, and they choose a, uh, a welded rigid chair. There are some other uh, uh, features to it, uh, to the sports chairs. Um, in the back, there is there's a, there's an anti-tip, which is a small caster or small two casters in the rearmost part of the chair, which, uh, which keeps you from uh, flipping over backwards. So it helps you be really stable, but also adds a neat component. It allows you to get much more uh, aggressive with just how fast your chair can spin. And so it can kind of compensate uh, for any concerns having to do with balance. And it's really kind of revolutionized the sport in the last, uh, in the last 10 years. Um, then uh, another part that's, uh, that's important, you, know, you wouldn't buy the most expensive basketball shoes you could find uh, and, then, and then not lace them up. And so strapping has to do with once you're, once you're sitting in a basketball wheelchair, um, you can use uh, a variety of things for securing yourself to the basketball chair. And some people that kind of frightens them at first, they're like, well, why would I want to be strapped into that thing so hard? And the thing is, is that after you start competing, you understand that, you know what, the more strapped in, the more one I am with my equipment, the better off I am. And so um, click straps have become the, the term that people are used to using um, uh, for the ones that are pictured there. Velcro straps are still commonly used and have been used for years and are, and are still a great solution for a lot of people. But uh, predominantly on the chairs that we build and manufacture and design today, um, the click straps as pictured there, they're actually like a ratcheting strap and a technology that comes from snowboard bindings. And, uh, and so when I, when I, when I uh, click or ratchet into my basketball chair, I get to the point where really I couldn't sneeze without my basketball chair doing something. And so that level of responsiveness can be super beneficial. And so, and so why do we want to take this time to talk about equipment? Um, because the better your equipment fits you, the quicker you'll be able to move the faster you'll be able to change direction, and the, 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 the better you can do those things, the more fun you have when you're competing. And so equipment does play a role as far as uh, people being involved with and getting the most out of uh, their participation physically in wheelchair basketball. Um, that's where I, unless, uh, unless, unless Dan or Randy have any questions about uh, equipment, I was going to hand it off to, to some of the benefits. Well, I think we're, uh, we're actually only got about 17 minutes left, so let's uh, kind of get through uh, through this, we make sure we have some Q&A time left for everybody. Sounds good. All right. So uh, thank you, Paul. A great explanation of the equipment. And uh, obviously, Paul covered a lot of the benefits of wheelchair basketball when he was telling you about how uh, wheelchair basketball impacted his life. Um, but just want to touch on a few of the things and, and kind of group them out here in three different categories. On this slide, we've got social and mental. And uh, obviously, wheelchair basketball um, in the United States, it's a nationwide sport. There's over 200 teams competing. Uh, there's a great opportunity to get on a team, to travel within your region, to travel the country, and as, as Paul let you know, to travel the world. And obviously, uh, you're doing that. You're going to introduce, get introduced to a lot of new people, make a lot of new friends. Um, and, and that's all great. But I think, for me, one of the things that I've been most impressed with over the years, uh, watching new players come in, um, not just watching them develop as basketball players, not just watching their confidence improve, not just watching them get healthier and stronger, but, but it's amazing how, how much a new player learns from uh, people who've been involved in the sport about just how to negotiate daily obstacles. Um, you know, Paul talked about, you know, how, how, um, uh, Chris getting up off the floor, um, 
in that first practice he went to, uh, learning those things. People, I've seen people that come into wheelchair basketball practice who, who were borderline independent in their daily lives and after six months of wheelchair basketball were completely independent. Not because they didn't have the ability to do that, but they didn't have that network around them of people who've lived through it, the people that had been there and done that, that could take them under their wing and show them. And that's definitely, I think, one of the major social benefits that you can get from wheelchair basketball or really any other adapted sport is you're going to be around people that are living their lives, that they're professionals, they're educated, they have jobs, they have careers, they have families, and you've got someone, people right in front of you that are living examples of what's possible and help show you the things that they did and um, probably some of the things they wish they hadn't had done to get there so that uh, you don't have to repeat their mistakes. Um, one of the things, I, you know, uh, um, I think all of us that have been involved in wheelchair basketball for a long time, we've all got a different stories, and I do want to share one story about the, the impact of wheelchair basketball that was close to me. Uh, when I first got involved in wheelchair basketball, I coached uh, a junior team in Chicago, and I had one particular athlete who had multiple disabilities. Uh, he wasn't a really great athlete, but he was a great kid. I, I liked him a lot. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, when coaching that junior team, everybody always played. Um, so Jake would always get his minutes. They weren't always a lot of minutes, but he'd get his minutes. And uh, it just so happened one summer uh, between seasons, he'd gone in for an elective surgery, and things didn't go well and he never made it out of the hospital, and he passed away. And it, it kind of hit me hard because because Jake wasn't a great uh, player, um, I, I really questioned whether or not that I had done right by Jake. Did I make his experience in wheelchair basketball worth it to him? And as we were going to his funeral, I was really struggling with this. Um, didn't really know what to expect. As I said, he was, he was a kid with multiple disabilities, didn't know what kind of turnout he would have and uh, was really just overjoyed when we pulled up to the funeral home. And, and he went to a high school of probably about 1,500 kids, and I think about 1,499 of them showed up. So um, that was really kind of heartwarming to see that. But uh, at the same time, I'm struggling thinking, did I do right by this? Did I make, did, did I make or was wheelchair basketball a positive impact on Jake's life? And I was standing in line with my assistant coach and some of our players, and we're making our way up making our way up to, uh, to uh, Jake. And when I got about 10 feet away, I could kind of see over everybody. And what I saw um, to this day uh, just brings the emotion out in me. Uh, Jake's mother buried him in his basketball uniform. And, you know, it, it was almost, uh, um, it's almost silly in my mind that I was questioning if, if basketball was a positive influence once I saw that. So uh, I think that kind of really sums up uh, just about everything <laughs> when we think about, when we try to talk about what kind of benefit can wheelchair basketball have in a person's life. For Jake, it was one of the most important things in his life. And, uh, and speaking with his mother, it was just one of the, one of the biggest positive impacts that he could have had. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that I was, had an opportunity to be part of that. And that's one of the reasons that I stick with wheelchair basketball is, is uh, whether you're running a program or you're an athlete, you have, that, you have the ability to have that type of impact on those people that you're around. Um, moving on to the physical benefits, uh, and I'll actually defer to Paul about this a little a bit. Um, I think one of the, you can read the, you know, read the list there, but I think the, the important one is, Paul, how much, what kind of impact did those first six months of playing wheelchair basketball have on your just activities? Well, well the, uh, you know, the physical impact on me uh, was, was, was after the first night, I, I never thought my shoulders could ever be that sore in my entire life. Um, but then very quickly, which is, which is like anything, you know, any, any person alive, I think when they, when they experience really, really good strenuous exercise, they're that, there's that soreness afterwards, but then they feel the benefits from it. And that's what I really fell in love with. I mean, within two or three weeks of playing wheelchair basketball, I noticed that my transfer was better. The way that I was able to get out of my wheelchair and into, into our family car or our family van improved. Uh, and, and, and just the way that I felt in general 
um, getting my heart rate up. I mean, there's we could there's studies all day long that talk about the, phys the, the physical benefits of anybody exercising, and for a person in a wheelchair, um, whether it was transfers or the health of uh, of my the health of my entire body, not excluding anything, um, was improved as I exercised. So it had a great impact on me. Excellent. And with that, uh, we're uh, starting to get into crunch time here, so I do want to turn it over to Randy and uh, let him tell you a little bit more about the NWBA, um, just to the width and breadth of the organization and how you can get connected to your local program. So, Randy? Thank you, Dan. And uh, again, I would like to thank Rob and uh, Reeves Foundation for hosting this. Uh, again, we are always trying to promote uh, uh, our sport and the opportunities it uh, provides for individuals with physical disabilities. So again, thank you for that. Um, just a few quick things about our organization. Um, I had the privilege of being involved uh, uh, at the end of the Vietnam War. Um, I was going to school at the University of Illinois and working with a lot of Vietnam vets coming back who were either paralyzed or had amputations. And um, uh, the history of our organization really goes back to our program was 65 years old this year. We were founded in 1948 by a gentleman named Dr. Timothy Nugent, um, who uh, went on to um, he was he was uh, injured in the Battle of Bulge, and he came back uh, as an injured veteran himself and uh, looked around and saw an awful lot of vets sitting around in VA hospitals who had amputations. Uh, have physical disabilities from their war wounds and thought that basketball might be a great way to help with rehabilitation. Uh, that was the initial thrust of, of how we got started. And from there we kind of just grew from then. Uh, we were a very heavily oriented uh, veteran organization in the beginning. Uh, this year uh, we have over 2,200 registered players on over 207 teams. Uh, across the country. So we've come a long way. We still have a strong uh, veteran presence. Over 10% of our membership are veterans. We work very closely with uh, Wounded Warriors and uh, the PVA uh, wheelchair games as well. Uh, but uh, um, our players come from all different genres in terms of uh, what they're doing. We have five different divisions uh, within our uh, organization, uh, eight championship divisions. The more elite group of players, um, and Paul is in this group, uh, many of our Paralympic athletes play in the championship division, which is our um, most competitive league. Uh, our second league is more uh, based on uh, skill development and recreation, although if you are a D3 person on the phone or if you've ever seen D3, um, uh, it's just as competitive as the championship division. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Our women's division is comprised of uh, seven teams. Uh, uh, within the women's division, we actually have 11 uh, women's divisions teams, but uh, four of those are in the intercollegiate division. And then uh, we have just a gigantic uh, growth and development of our junior division. Uh, and we look at that from uh, having uh, two groups. Uh, our, our higher skilled uh, teams uh, play in what we call our varsity division. Uh, when they go to the national championships, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, the NIT, which is, uh, again, very skilled players, but um, a, a little bit lower on the, on the skill set area and development. And then we've got a developmental league called the Prep League, which is 12 and under. They play with an 8.5-foot basket, and the whole goal is to introduce youth to uh, wheelchair basketball and give them a chance to, to really um, not only fall in love with the sport, but uh, uh, get involved. We're also on eight college campuses uh, throughout the country, and uh, we have uh, eight men's teams and four women's teams. And uh, this year we added Auburn University, and we have another uh, a number of other schools uh, that are, are looking uh, to try to break into the collegiate ranks uh, as we move forward. As uh, Paul mentioned during his um, uh, his um, presentation, you know, he went to UTA. Um, uh, many of our many of our athletes get to go to uh, college on a full ride scholarship. So uh, great advantages for the players who work really hard to to end up being collegiate student athletes and, and experiencing that 
uh, from from the perspective of of uh, again a uh, wheelchair sports aspect. The other thing I would tell you is that within our organization. Um, we kind of have uh, two different branches of our organization. We do have our high performance branch. We are recognized by uh, the USOC as the uh, official DSO, Disabled Sports Organization for Wheelchair Basketball in the United States, as well as the IWBF, International Wheelchair ba Basketball Federation, sees us in the same light. Um, and um, again, being both the oldest and the largest uh, wheelchair sports organization uh, in, the, in the United States. Uh, one of the more impressive pieces as well is that um, this year in Louisville we will hold the uh, largest uh, wheelchair basketball tournament in the history of the world. Um, we'll have over a thousand uh, delegates in Louisville, Kentucky, and it will also be the largest wheelchair sporting event in the world this year too. So the scope and breadth of the NWBA is large, and we are always looking to make it larger. So um, if any of you are not affiliated right now with a team, want to get involved, Sharice Fox is our program director. You can also go on our website, which is on the slide, nwba.org. Uh, we are coming close to the end of our season for this year, but we start up again. Um, practices usually begin in September. And um, if, if anybody is interested in looking for a referral to put a person on a team, if you're looking to volunteer a coach, uh, we can always find a place for you. So with that, I will turn it back to Dan, uh, and we'll go through our question period. Thank you, Randy. Uh, and we are running short, but we do have a couple questions. One of the first questions that came in was uh, about logistics. How do you transport athletes, players, coaches uh, to these tournaments? And uh, there's uh, no one answer for that. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I've done it numerous ways. I'm sure Paul's done it numerous ways. Um, you can uh, pack in a caravan and pack all the equipment and the chairs into multiple cars and do it that way. Um, we've rented uh, 15 passenger vans uh, and done that. Um, you can do buses. Uh, the, the, the thing to keep in mind is you just have to be a little bit creative about it. But transportation is usually one of the most uh, cost uh, um, prohibitive things uh, or one of the reasons why people don't get involved in uh, adapted sports is the cost of transportation. It's not cheap, but uh, when you do it for a while, you can get pretty creative. We uh, One year when we took our women's team to nationals, we got uh, eight players, three coaches, and 13 wheelchairs between everyday chairs and basketball chairs into two Kia Sportages. So if that can be done, <laughs> almost almost anything can be done. Um, enclosed trailers is another good thing. If you're going to start a program, uh, that's good, something good to put in a budget. A nice little 4 by 8 enclosed trailer can hold about 15, 16 wheelchairs, your balls, your, your toolbox, your equipment, your luggage. Um, and, and, and that can do it really well. Um, I think uh, probably, probably the other thing to note on that is you don't need special equipment uh, for wheelchair basketball. Um, you, don't, you don't need accessible vans. You don't need accessible buses. Uh, you just need to have the, the desire to get from point A to point B and uh, a little bit of ingenuity about how you're going to make use of what you have available to do it. Um, anything you want to add to that, Paul? I don't think so. I think you covered it really well. I've done just about everything. I've driven in my own car. I've I've been inside a, 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 a rented rented minivan, a 15 passenger van, just about anything. Yep. Anything to make it happen. Um, one of the other questions we had is um, how can you how can you teach a person or what's the best shot type for a person who can't use the beef method? And for those of you that aren't familiar with the beef method, that's that's how you teach uh, the, the the textbook one-handed shot with the guide hand on the side of the ball, balance, eyes, elbow, follow through. And uh, I guess there's two parts to that question. You know, does the player have enough strength to get the ball to the basket two-handed? Um, if the answer is yes, then you still utilize the beef method. You just utilize two hands, and you virtually teach it the same way you would teach a chest pass. 
Um, you position your hands just a little bit differently, a little bit more behind the ball with your hands a little bit more vertical. You still want to make the, uh, the L shapes with your elbows. You still want to be balanced in the chair, balance the ball in your hands. You want to get your eye on the target. Um, you, you still want to follow through, flipping your wrist the same way you would with a one-handed sh with a one-handed shot. So um, that's the first way I try to teach it. Now, if you're talking about someone who kind of has to bring the ball way behind them with one hand and kind of do a baseball throw to get it up there, um, my recommendation is you don't. Um, there's two things you can do with that. I, I don't like players trying to do that just to get a shot up in the air. Um, what I do is I get a smaller ball. If a women's ball is still too big, then I get a smaller ball. I go down to the little 9-inch balls, and I try, to, I try to teach them the right form from there and let, them, and let them develop their strength until they can get into a two-handed shot and then develop into a single-handed shot. And one of the reasons for that is when you think about wheelchair basketball, and if you have to go behind your back one-handed, Think of what happens in a game. If somebody reaches back and tries to block that thing, now you're looking at an immediate shoulder injury. So teaching that method or allowing that method to go on could actually increase the risk of injury uh, with an athlete. Um, anything, you have any thoughts on that, Paul, with uh, someone who can't just do a textbook one-handed? Uh, sure, beat? sure. Um, you know, my, uh, because I, when, I, when I first, first started, um, I didn't. I didn't have the uh, the strength to reach the basket from very far away. And so, in a nutshell, what I recommended to people as far as shooting form is is that I, I started with a one hand baseball type uh, throw that was my shot uh, from further out, and I was able to develop that chest pass type shot um, from very close distances. And so, for me, in my initial uh, enjoyment of the sport for a short period of time, it was that one arm baseball pass. But I, I, I will echo what you said that, that sooner or later, somebody, somebody reaching and, and really trying to block that shot right when you're trying to throw it uh, could, could, have, could have led to an injury. And so, um, when it comes to shooting form, one of the pieces of advice I give is that there's been a lot of very interesting shooting forms, uh, even in the NBA throughout yep. the years. And, uh, and I would say, ultimately, you want to follow uh, good shooting mechanics so you can keep a repeatable, uh, a repeatable form that you can work on and develop. Uh, but ultimately, I think each person uh, develops their own little variation on how they shoot a basketball. And, and I've found that even though my, my, my technique and my form might not be perfect, if I spend right the, the right amount of time uh, working on it and developing it, um, I've seen a lot of people uh, develop some some unconventional shots, shot techniques that turned out to be absolutely deadly. Uh, this shot a very, very high percentage and had a great time playing the sport. So I wouldn't be discouraged at all if, if you feel like you're not somebody that fits into the, the traditional mold of a, of a shooting technique, uh, but to really just enjoy the sport for what it is and, and continue to find uh, new and different ways to develop your form. Yep. And, and the key is consistency. Whatever form you use, just make it consistent. Um, and, uh, you know, the perfect example of that is Jim Furyk in golf. He's got the ugliest golf swing that I've ever seen in my life for a professional, but it makes him $10 million a year So because it's consistent. Um, so that's, that's one of the keys. There, you know, everybody's going to be a little bit different, but just try to do the same thing every time, and you'll get that in there. Um, we have one person on the phone line. Uh, would, if they would like to ask a question, you can just hit 66 to unmute your line and uh, fire away. Maybe not. <laughs> Hello. Hello? Yes. Uh, just wanted to give you gentlemen a comment on how wonderful wheelchair basketball is. Last in 1979, the uh, local team from Lansing, a wheelchair basketball team called the Globe Rollers, played the Michigan State Spartans in a wheelchair basketball game. The Spartans had just won the NCAA basketball championship the week before. It was a fabulous game, a sellout, Jenison Fieldhouse, 10,000 fans, and they made a $10,000 fund profit that was donated to multiple sclerosis. Just wanted to let you know that that can be a big impact when you have a fundraiser and involve a team that's very well known. And I would suggest maybe thinking about your organization planning a game with the, land, the Globe Rollers to uh, try maybe... Uh, Harlem Globetrotters. So give some thought to a 
at your basketball game, like the Globetrotters did for the Spartans, you could do that with the Harlem Globetrotters. So just uh, a thought. Thanks for a wonderful presentation today. I learned a lot. Thank you, and uh, thanks, for that, uh, thanks for that suggestion. And if you just want to hit 6-3 to remute your, remute your phone. Um, I think uh, I don't see other questions on the chat line. Um, but uh, so I guess we are at, we're about five minutes over. I will put uh, the NWBA contact information back up there. And uh, just once again, I'd like to really thank uh, Paul and Randy for their time in helping with this presentation. And again, thank Rob and the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And thank all of you that uh, were able to tune in live uh, for this webinar and all of those uh, out there who are going to watch this in the archives. Uh, hopefully, uh, we gave you some information to help get you connected to wheelchair basketball, uh, to help get you more active and uh, enjoy a sport that we all love and uh, get uh, more opportunities out there for people to uh, get active uh, through the sport of wheelchair basketball. Rob? Great job, everybody. The, uh, just so you know, the archive, by the way, uh, tomorrow at some point I will post it, and it will be at ChristopherReeve.org slash webcasts, with an S at the end, webcast slash webcast. Um, we also just uh, recently, it'll be available on iTunes as well when we get it there, so you can listen to it uh, on your iPod or your iPhone. Uh, and then the other thing to let you know is that at ChristopherReeve.org slash sports, uh, we do have a little group that has started uh, in support of adaptive sports. So that's wheelchair basketball or alpine skiing or whatever else you want to get into. Uh, so that's a good place to post questions. And if anybody goes there and posts questions about basketball, I will be sure uh, to forward it to our wonderful panel. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. This was really great. I really appreciate it. More than welcome. And we'll see you guys all next time. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.